Senhoras e senhores, bom dia. Damos início neste momento. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. We're now going to start the UFMG Summer School on Brazilian Study. For the opening, I will hand it over to the team of uh, UFMG, Professor Sandra Regina Almeida. Good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to be here with you today to, in the opening for yet another summer school on Brazilian study at the Federal University of Minas Gerais. I'd like to start by greeting our dear Professor Aziz Saliba, Professor David Lopez, both in the International Relations Department of the University of uh, Minas Gerais. I'd also like to greet the entire International Relations team at UFMG who have put together this important summer school on Brazilian studies for our partners all over the world and for people who are curious about learning more about Brazil. I also respectfully uh, greet Dr. Silva Steiner, who will be our get keynote speaker in the opening lecture in the Summer School on Brazilian Studies today. So, Professor Steiner, thank you very much. We're very happy to have you here, even though it's virtually. We hope to soon be able to welcome you in person in our institution. I start then welcoming everyone all over the world who have joined us in this summer school, who is once again happening online, just like last year. Unfortunately, the pandemic still doesn't allow us to receive you and welcome you on our campus, but we hope to do so next year so that you can visit us in our home. But we are still going through a difficult time in the, time in the history of humanity. This pandemic it has not only triggered the most serious sanitation crisis of, of all times, but also it triggered a very serious economic crisis that has uh, hit all the world and especially Brazil. I'd like to give my love to everyone that has lost anyone to the virus and uh, i would like to say that we are very happy to be able to be here even though we are still uh, online but it's always a good opportunity to talk to you to talk to our partners and tell you a bit of brazil the history geography the culture of our country the arts law society in Brazil. And it's always very good to be able to show a bit of what we have in our institution regarding Brazilian studies. And we have a lot. So I'd uh, like this to be the first step of a long relationship that you have with our company, whether if you're coming here virtually or face to face. We hope that soon you can visit us in person here in our institution. UFMG is an important uh, institution in the state of Minas Gerais and also in Brazil as a whole. This has been a difficult year, but somehow it has been satisfactory for our company as we see the quality of our institution acknowledged not only in Brazil, but also abroad. So this year, UFMG was assessed as the best federal university in Brazil. This is um, granted by an institute from the Ministry of Education. We were also considered the fifth best university in Latin America by Times Education. And recently we received an innovation grant as the most innovative university by Gary Analytics. So we were considered by them among the best universities in Brazil. We're very happy to have our quality 
acknowledged in such exceptional times of history. So not only quality is being acknowledged, but also the relevance of our institution has been tested over and over in the past few uh, months. Last year, we we're very much impacted by the pandemic, as I mentioned, and we had to migrate into the online context, and we didn't stop for a minute. We resumed class online. We started reflecting on learning and teaching uh, online, and we tried to cover the demands of our society. We have uh, State two state of the art uh, hospitals that work in the Brazilian unified healthcare system, the SUS, that played a very important role during the pandemic. UFMG owns two hospitals that have treated COVID victims uh, throughout this year. We have become a COVID-19 reference hospitals in the city of Belo Horizonte. We also serve uh, uh, the vulnerable populations. We have done one third of the COVID testing in the state of Belo, uh, in the state of Minas Gerais, and we have also been provided vaccination. We have uh, research on vaccines as well and uh, we are very much advanced in that. So it's important to invest in vaccine technology. So our institution is trying to accommodate all of the demands of our country and society. We haven't stopped for a minute and we don't intend to. We have done what is expected of a public relevant quality institution, an institution that is relevant not only for our city, the capital city of the state of Minas Gerais, but also for our state and our country. So this is the context in which we welcome you virtually here. And of course, we soon hope you can come to our institution face to face and learn about our, our programs. I hope we have a great time uh, during the summer school. I'm sure that Professor Aziz and the international relations team have targeted this team for toward our tar, our foreign students and prospective students. I wish you all a very nice. Uh, you all have a very nice time in the summer school, and I hope to see you all soon. Thank you very much. Uh, the director of international director of UFMG, Professor Aziz Saliba, is going to introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you very much. I'd like to start by greeting Professor Sandra Almeida, our Dean, for all, for all of the support she has given to us. I'd also like to greet our dear keynote speaker, Professor uh, Sylvia Steiner, and greet the international relations team my friend uh, David Lopez for having prepared all of this event. In 2016, we presented the International Relations Director a proposal to create a course that would discuss Brazil in its different dimensions, historical, legal, artistic, cultural, economic, sociological. So, Back then, I didn't realize the project would be accept, would flourish, and that in the near future, together with Professor David St. Lopez, I would be working on this program. And we had no idea that uh, this would become so international as a result of a pandemic, which brought a lot of suffering to everyone. So I'm here to manifest my solidarity to everyone who has uh, lost loved ones, have lost their jobs, and are suffering the effects of this pandemic. Last year, in the first edition of the summer school, we had 10 countries participating. Today, in the second edition, we have 35. We have uh, representatives from 51 institutions of all continents 
join us here today. I welcome all of you here, and I wish you have a great time during the summer school. And as our dean said, there was a lot of dedication involved in the preparation of this course. In the near future, we expect to be able to have you here with us in the beautiful Belo Horizonte. To mark this occasion, we are honored to have with us Mrs. Silva Steiner. She is an expert in uh, criminal law by the University of Brasilia and a master in uh, international law by the University of Sao Paulo. She has worked as a federal regional court judge in Brazil, and she became the first Brazilian judge in the international criminal law at, at court where she worked from 2003 to 2016. She is a founder of the Brazilian Institute of Criminal Sciences. She is a member of the executive committee of the Brazilian section of the International Commission of Jurists, and she's a member of Judges for Democracy. She was a member of the Brazilian official delegation to the preparatory commission of the International Criminal Court. Dr. Silva Steiner, thank you very much for accepting our invite, and thank you very much for being here with us. Dr. Silva Steiner is going to be approaching uh, inter international crimes uh, and crimes against humanity, and of course, this is a very current topic. Thank you very much. Over to you. Good morning, everyone. I want to start by thanking for this information, um, the kind words of Professor Sandra Regina, the Dean of UFMG. Thank for the invitation by my dear friend, Dr. Aziz Saliba, and also Professor Davidson Belen Lopez. Thank you very much for this kind invitation. And I'm very happy to be here. Uh, it's also, I'm greatly honored to have this opportunity to make the first lecture for this summer school. Well, it's a summer school for those that are in the Northern Hemisphere. Here where we are in Brazil, it would be much more of a winter school because we're now in our cold season and it's very cold. So as I said, it's a great pleasure to be here. And I'm not going to call this a lecture. This is going to be more of a conversation of this very current theme and of crimes against humanity. Um, as all of you know, we've been talking a lot, especially in Brazil at this current time, about certain conducts that may be classified as crimes against humanity and sometimes conducts that could be considered genocide. And I think uh, it's very timely to bring uh, the legal standpoint because legal operators need to attain to the letter of the law and the input the interpretation given by doctrine and case law to such statutes and norms, in particular regarding international law, which is still largely unknown to those of us in Brazil. And that's why I think it's very important to see this work being done by UFMG, by their Department of International Relations. We try to disseminate international law among our students and also students from all around the world. 
and I think everyone gains with this contribution of new points of view. So today I'm going to talk to you about crimes against humanity and how these crimes are found in the statutes, especially the Rome statute. And at a second moment, the interpretation that the courts have been giving to this, especially the International Criminal Court regarding the definition of what are crimes against humanity. So for those of you that do not know the Rome Statute very well, let's remember what Article 7 of that Statute of the International Criminal Court says. The Rome Statute was passed in July 1st of 2002, and it does not have retroactive jurisdiction. So the crimes listed in it, crimes against humanity, genocide, war crimes, and the crime of assault described here can only be tried by the ICC when committed after the statute was enacted. So that is after 1st of July of 2002. In the Rome statute, crimes against humanity include murder, extermination, enslavement, deportation or forcible transfer of population, imprisonment or other severe deprivation of physical liberty in violation of fundamental rules of international law, torture, rape, sexual slavery, enforced prostitution, forced pregnancy, enforced sterilization, or any other form of sexual violence of comparable gravity persecution against any identifiable group or collectively on political, racial, national, ethnic, cultural, religious, and gender features or other grounds that are universally recognized as impermissible under international law in connection with any act refer to in this paragraph or any crime within the jurisdiction of the ICC. Also enforced disappearance of persons, the crime of appetite, and other inhumane acts of a similar character that intentionally causes great suffering or serious injury to body or to mental or physical health. Uh, Brazil recognizes most of the conducts which are considered crimes in the domestic law of most modern nations. So in this case, it's important to understand what exactly distinguishes these criminal conducts that exist in domestic law of the nations from similar conducts that are considered crimes against humanity by international law. If the conducts are similar, what distinguishes regular crimes from international crimes? That is the key question that we are going to try and answer here. Often in the field of law, we are faced with concepts that to be understood in their full extent require that we take a walk through the history of these concepts from their birth to their recognition as established concepts, in this case, in one or more branches of law. So to truly understand the current concept of crimes against humanity, as they are right now as typical crimes of international criminal law, we need to know a little bit about the origin of such crimes. 
So now we are going to stroll through the evolution of the concept of crimes against humanity. International law traditionally has always been concerned with the relations between nations. It was precisely in the fields of international human laws, which was commonly called the law of war, that international law began to deal with persons individually considered. It was because of the horrors seen on battlefields that in the middle of the 19th century, to be more exact, in 1864, the first set of rules of international law aimed at protecting certain groups and people in armed conflicts were established. So in other words, international law assumed for the first time in history a regulatory role regulatory role that limited the activity of sovereign states restricting the broad freedom of these states to conduct hostilities so within the classical view of international law this new branch of international human rights law was at the time almost revolutionary. The first conventions regulating the conduct of hostilities, limiting the level of force necessary to weaken the potential enemy, and also that regulated the protection of persons not taking an active part in combat or that have ceased to do so were passed in 1864 and are the basis of this new branch of international law dedicated to systematizing violations of the uses and customs of war international human rights law ends up establishing certain rules of protection to specific groups and it was from this idea of protection, even in situations of armed conflict, that the first references to certain reprehensible conduct, to those typical of violations of the law of war, appear. But these, however, were committed on the fringes of the conflicts. And here, I cite Otto Trifter and Caio Ambos. I recall that the concept of acts against humanity was first mentioned in the St. Petersburg Declaration of 1868, which limited the use of incendiary or explosive projectiles as they were contrary to the laws of humanity. So remember that expression contrary to the laws of humanity. And the preambles to the Hague Convention on the Laws and Customs of War of 1899 and in the Hague Convention of 1907, the so-called Martin's Clause was adopted. It was proposed by the Russian delegate to that first convention, and according to that clause, and here I transcribe it, even in cases not expressly provided for in the rules of international human rights law, the people and the belligerent parties remain under the protection and the rules and principles of the laws of nations, which result from the usages established among civilized people, the laws of humanity, and the dictates of public conscience. So in other words, and with great resonance in the law of peoples, this super positive protection that derives from the laws of humanity and the dictates of the public conscience is consecrated as one of the most relevant general principles of international law. And Therefore, it is still in effect today. The first formal reference to the existence of conduct that would later be recognized as crimes against humanity, we could already see, for example, in the 1915 Declaration of Petrograd, which was signed by Great Britain, Russia, and France, 
against the massacre of Armenians by the Turks. That declaration classifies such acts as crimes against humanity and civilization and for which the Turkish government must be held responsible along with its agents involved in those massacres. Subsequently, we have the Treaty of Versailles of 1919 at the end of World War I, which established the recognition of individual criminal responsibility for violations of the laws of humanity. So, still using the expression of the Martins Clause, violations of the laws of humanity, among, among which were murder, massacres, terrorism, killing of hostages, torture of civilians, starvation as a means of annihilating populations, rape, kidnapping of girls and women for the purpose of forced prostitution, deportation of civilians, and forced labors. Act when these acts were perpetrated in connection with military operations. The then created Commission on the Responsibility of the author, Authors of the War and on Enforcement of Penalties had proposed at the peace conference the prosecution of crimes against the laws of humanities. And this proposal had been rejected because of the vagueness and relatively relativity of the concepts of principles and laws of humanity. I'm not going to dwell here on the process of evolution of international human rights law as our themes leads up to the analysis of crimes against humanity. But it is important to refer to the beginnings of international human law because this topic of crimes against humanity leads us to analyze such crimes. So we need to understand where international human rights law comes from and the consecration of the so-called principles of humanity because they serve as the dogmatic and normative basis for the recognition of conduct that amount to war crimes when perpetrated in times of faith peace. And these are the crimes against humanity. So I repeat, conduct that amount to war crimes when perpetrated in times of peace. These are the crimes against humanity. As early as 1943, still during the Second World War, the Commission on War Crimes of the League of Nations suggests that certain acts and certain conducts were considered crimes against humanity. And this was the first time that this expression was used in this context. The, commu the Commission found that several of the atrocities that were being committed on and off the battlefields could not technically be considered war crimes. But because of their gravity, they could not go unpunished. It was from this that appeared the equally technical concept of crimes against humanity in the strict sense. The proposal of the conduct as crimes was finally incorporated into the charter of the International Military Court at the London Conference in 1945. So this is the first time where we have the expression crimes against humanity clearly identified and, de and defined. Article 6, item C of the charter provided that crime against humanities are murder, extermination, enslavement, deportation, and other inhumane acts committed against the civilian population, population before, during wartime, or persecution for political, racial, and religious reasons in 
execution or in connection with any war crime within the jurisdiction of the court, whether or not they violated the domestic laws where they were perpetrated. So when we refer to the charter, this is the charter that created the International Military Court of Nuremberg. And this definition was also the basis for Article 11, Item C of the Allied Control Council Law Number 10 of 1945 and Article 6 of the Tokyo Charter of 1946. And we have to remember that the Allied Control Council Law, unlike the London Charter, did not translate an international document. This was a domestic law established for the trial of German criminals by German courts. And Article 11 of the Allied Council Law had was drafted with words closer to the definition of the Nuremberg Court and defined crimes against humanity as atrocities and offenses, including murder, extermination, enslavement, deportation, detention, torture, rape, or other inhumane acts against any civilian population or persecution for political, racial, or religious reasons, whether or not they are violations of the laws of the countries in which they were committed. In contrast, Article 6, Item C of the Tokyo Charter, which established the military court for the Far, Far East, defined crimes against humanity as murder, extermination, enslavement, deportation, and other inhumane acts committed before or during wartime, or persecution for political, racial, or religious grounds in execution or in connection with any crime within the jurisdiction of that court, whether or not the conduct violated national laws of the country in which it was committed leaders, organizers, instigators, and accomplices who participated in the formulation and execution of a common plan or a conspiracy to commit the crimes are responsible for all acts perpetrated by any person in the execution of such plan. So here we clearly see that the main differences between those two documents are the ref is the reference to atrocity and offenses, which exists in Article 11, Item C, and the addition of crimes of detention and rape in that same document. And in the Tokyo Charter, you have the absence of any reference to the necessary crimes against peace or war crimes, which also introduced the notion of common plan which we'll return to later. So these post-war presidents are therefore the basis for the elaboration of a set of norms that define what are the crimes against humanity. They are the extension of violations already consecrated to situations under the law of war, to situations that strictly keep speaking are not necessarily related to armed conflict and defined as war crimes. So, in short, the standards of protection applicable in times of war are extended to the protection of populations in times of peace. When the Nuremberg International Court was established in 1945, its statute included crimes against humanity among its competencies, although it was still related to war situation. In the words of Justice Jackson from the United States, who helped draft that statute, said, international law in principle is not concerned with violations committed by a state against its own citizens. 
In the case of Germany, however, the program of elimination of Jews and other minorities were part of a plan to wage an illegal war and therefore of international interest. In, from these words, a key concept is already extracted for understanding the crimes against the humanity, which are part of the plan. Remember, before I mentioned the Tokyo Charter that uh, talked about a common plan, and here we are talking about a key concept that has been sourced by words by Judge uh, Judson, which is a part of a plan. Resolution 95, paragraph 1, 95, item 1 of the UN Assembly of uh, 1946 declared uh, that uh, the Nuremberg Law is part of the general international law. And as some claim, the Charter of the Nuremberg International Military Court is a mandatory instrument of international law. And it concludes that the concept of uh, crimes against humanity is totally incorporated to international law. These been de being uh, translated as analogous to war crimes, as an extinction of them based on the same moral and legal, legal principles that have existed for a long time and that underlie the principles and norms of uh, rules of uh, humanitarian. And uh, these are the words of Bastiani, who is one of the greatest articulators of the creation and preparation of the Rome Statue of the ICC. In a post-war uh, effort to typify the post-war crimes, the International Law Commission, which was established in 1947, was charged with formulating the principles of international law recognized in the Nuremberg Charter and uh, the crimes in this uh, trial to prepare a draft of a code of crimes and against peace and security of mankind. In the preparation of its first re report in 1950, the International Commission presented a list of crimes that should be punished under international law, including crimes against humanity. The proposal mirrored Article 6, Item 6 of the Nuremberg Charter, already excluding the necessary connection with war crimes or crimes against peace. Successive proposals and discussions postponed the conclusions of the Code of Crimes Against Peace and Security of Mankind from the presentation of the first proposal in 1954 until the final proposal in 1996. In the former, in the latter, the wording of the Caput of Article 16 provided that the crime against the humanity means any of uh, of the following acts when committed in a systematic or in a in systematically way or in a large scale and directed and instigated by a government organization or a, gr a group. So in the 1996 proposal, as you can see, in the crime again, in the proposal of crimes against uh, mankind, we have all of the elements that would then be uh, present in the statute of the ICC. In the same post-war period, the newly created United Nations Organization launched to the world of the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide in 1948, the Four Geneva Conditions in 49, the Supplementary on the Abolition of Slavery, Slave Trade, and Institution and slave and slave like institutions and practices of 56 the convention on the elimination of all forms of racial discrimination in 1965 
The Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Violence Against Women, 1979. The Convention Against Torture and All Forms of Inhuman, Cruel, Degrading Treatment in, of 1984, among others. We also had the Convention of Non-Applicability or Statutory Limitations of War Crimes and Crimes Against Humanity of 1969, which provided these crimes uh, no signatory and no the, with no statutory limitations. The crimes against the humanity end up being comp contemplated in the legal corpus of international law. For this reason, and here I'm quoting Kayamas, the relevant context can be admitted in a broad way to such an extent to treat crimes against humanity as equivalent to human rights, which includes a broad range of conducts committed by state and non-state actors in times of war or peace. In any case, it's fair to say that in view of the various instruments mentioned, the crimes against humanity were already included in the customary international law even before Nuremberg. Finally, the, in 1977, we had the two additional protocols to the Geneva Conventions, which establish the incorporation of the before mentioned Martin's, Martin's Clause. The first protocol establishes in its first article that in the cases that are not covered are addressed in the protocol or other international agreements, civilians and combatants remain under the protection of uh, the and the authority of principles of international law derived from established customs, the principles of humanity, and the dictates of public conscience. The protocol, protocol two recalls in its preamble that uh, the basic human rights documents offer basic protection to individuals and that in the cases not covered in, by the existing law, human beings remain under the protection of the principles of humanity and the dictates of public conscience. Well, considering the grounds in which the joint elaboration of uh, international uh, law orders, which have been referred to as crimes against humanity, which are now expressed in the Rome Statute of the ICC, we are going to now talk about the contextual elements in the Rome Statute, which are precisely the elements that will allow us to distinguish the conducts of a common criminal law to the condition of crimes of international law. And this is all this return to the origins of the concepts of crimes against humanity seems necessary for us to understand the notion of crimes against humanity as the result of a vigorous historical evolution, which I personally see as being incompatible with the modern vulgarization of the concept, with the desire to extend it to conduct, which are serious, but by no means hold the historical gravity and of the constructs of the convicts covered by it. The concept of crimes against humanity is and must be, like any discussion of punitive penal character, formal and strict. They cannot suffer extensive interpretation. It does not allow for analogy. These requirements refer not only to the offices themselves, but also in relation to the crimes described in the Rome Statute, the so-called contextual elements, which are precisely what distinguishes between crimes under common law and crimes under international law. In short, 
we are going to stress this many times, what distinguishes crimes against humanity from regular crimes is precisely the existence of certain contextual elements which are not required to, to configure uh, regular courses. According to the Rom Statute, Article 7, these contextual elements are, first, the existence of an attack against the civilian population. Second, that this attack is widespread and systematically. And third, that there's a policy of a state or an organization in carrying out such attack. Crimes against humanity as an extension of war crimes are those crimes intended for the protection against the widespread and systematic attack against the civilian population carried out with the participation or even with the tolerance of those in power, whether this is political or military power. The immediate victims are the individuals, but the international community as a whole, and the humanity here is understand it as in truth as a value, is the immediate crime of this uh, victim of this crime. Crimes against uh, humanity suppose a threat against peace and the security of human humanity and the very survival of groups and communities. In the 19th, the United Nations Security Council established two ad hoc courts in Yugoslavia, 1993, and Rwanda in 1994, introduced in the list of uh, crimes under jurisdiction of these courts, crimes against humanity. And the first, uh, the court for former Yugoslavia is about uh, armed conflict that occurred in the Balkans region. The second did not accommodate this connection. Already in connection with the Yugoslavian court, in the first case, the court from that the connection with war crimes would be a condition to determine the jurisdiction of the course and not an element of the current concept of crimes against humanity. Article 5 of the Yugoslavia Statute Court to define the contextual elements of crimes against humanity as those committed in armed conflict. In, whether international or internal, that were directed to the civil, civilian population. To that extent, however, it was interpreted that it was it consisted of a series of conducts committed in a widespread or systematic fashion. The statute of the Rwanda court, third article, defined the context as part of a well widespread and systematic attack against any civilian population on account of nationality, politics, ethnic, ethics, and race and religion. Thus, the Yugoslavian court required, on the one hand, the existence of an armed conflict. Now, the Rwanda criminal court required a relationship with some kind of discrimination. But it was from the installation of ad hoc commission, uh, courts that the ILC resumed the task of preparing the creation of a permanent international criminal law. We will not dwell here on the various proposals of wording of the chapter again addressing crimes against humanity in a text which would then later become the Rom Statute, which was approved in the Rom Conference in 1998. So here, for the sake of brevity, we will uh, analyze Article 7 of the Rom Statute as approved in the Rom Conference. And the Rom Statute uh, describes the contextual elements of uh, crimes against humanity. 
Article 7, paragraph 1 mentions crimes against humanity means any of the following acts when committed as part of a widespread or systematic attack against any civilian population with knowledge of such attack. Paragraph 7 of the same article, for the purposes of, of paragraph 1, item A, attack direct against the civilian population, mean the course of conduct involving the multiple commission of the acts referred in paragraph 1 against any civil population pursuant to a policy of a state or organization to commit such attack. And next to the Rome statute, we have the elements of the, the crimes, which haven't yet been duly translated to Portuguese. So here I will make reference to the elements of crimes uh, with a free translation of the elements which are part of the introduction to the crimes against humanity. Introduction, paragraph one. Since Article 7 is part of international criminal law, its predictions in line with Article 22 must be strictly constructed, taking into account that crimes against humanity as defined in Article 7 are among the most serious crimes that can uh, be committed in the world and to concern the international community as a whole and require an authorized individual crime responsibility and require a conduct which is impermissible under international law, general applied and acknowledged by the main legal systems in the world. So the introduction makes refer reference to Article 22 of the Rom Statute, which expressly mentions the principle of a legal reservation, nulo pena sine legge, which means there's no crime without a law that defines it. And uh, therefore the application, and even more than that, in case there's doubts in terms of interpretation, the one which is most favorable to the accused, to the defendant, is the one to be adopted. Paragraph two of the introduction, the two elements of crimes against humanity describe the context in which the conduct must happen. These elements make it clear the requirements of participation in the conduct and the knowledge of the existence of a generalized attack and systematic attack against the civilian population. Finally, the third uh, paragraph of the introduction, an attack directed against the civilian population in this context, contextual element is understood as a course of conduct involving the multiple commission of acts referred to in Article 7, Paragraph 1. Assassination, detentions, rapes, and the disappearing of people against any civilian population pursuant to or in carrying out a policy of a state or organization determined to commit such attack. It is understood that a policy to commit such attack requires that the state or organization actively promotes or encourages such an attack against the civilian population. There, so these three paragraphs I've just referred to are paragraphs that mention the elements of the crimes under the Rome Statute, and therefore they should be interpreted according to this statute. The footnote, footnote number six to this introdu introduction provides and here, uh, free translation again, that the policy that the civilian population 
target the civilian population must be implemented by actions of the state or organization. Only in exceptional situations can such policy be implemented in a deliberate failure to act, which is consciously aimed at encouraging such attack. The existence of such policy cannot therefore be inferred only from the absence of governmental or organizational action. So see how important uh, the crimes of elements are in the three initial words and even in footnote number six. As in the elements of the crimes, so the express requirement that the conduct was committed as part of a widespread or systematic attack against the civilian population. And also that the perpetrator knew that the conduct was part or they had the intention of that conduct being part of a widespread or systemic attack directed against the civilian population. So this is the legal framework that determines the requirements of a crime against humanity. That is a crime under international law. So we reach our first conclusion that to fall within the scope of international criminal law, the act described murder, torture, sexual violence, slavery, appetite, must be linked to a functional relationship. There must be a functional relationship between the conduct and the context. The context must be the existence of an attack against the civilian population that this attack be widespread and systemic, and that it is perpetrated as part of a plan or policy of a state or an organization. So this is the context that distinguishes crimes against humanity under the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court under those that would be under the domestic jurisdiction of the nations as regular crimes. And I draw a parallel to war crimes that must also be committed within a context, the context of armed conflict. You don't have a war crime without this context of armed conflict. So there is no crime against humanity without of the systematic widespread attack against civilian population and that this is the result of a state policy or organization. So in summary, and here we refer to the history of drafting of Article 7, we see that there is no mandatory connection of crimes against humanity with situations of armed conflict or other crimes against peace. However, on the other hand, it does require that the conducts be perpetrated as part of an attack against the civilian population. And there is a threshold delimiting the definition of these attacks. So it must be widespread or systematic. And finally, that such an attack derives from a policy of a state or an organization. These elements were derived from post-war judgments in the Yugoslavia and Rwanda uh, criminal courts. And here we have the words of Daryl Robinson that here we have a high but disjunctive threshold, generalized or systematic, and I'm not sure if my choice of using threshold is the one, is the best way to say it, but one that is not so high, but conjunctive, multiple and political. So an attack needs to be widespread, understood as practice on a large scale, but it must have some scale affecting multiple victims. And the attack does not need to be systematic, 
and here I understand in systematic as requiring a methodical and orchestrated organization, but it must at least follow a policy or a plan of a state or organization. So, in conclusion, in the framework of the elements of crimes under international law, we can glimpse the idea of macro criminality. And here I cite Gerhard Veli. Individual context is described in the context of organized violence. Context, context circumstances are general requirements which as elements convert the acts into crimes under international law. The contextual element is contained in each offense as much as the objective element of the offense or as an integral part of the internal aspect of the offense. The generalized systematic attack against civilian population constitutes an element of the external aspect of the crime, such as armed conflict in war crimes. So, in the wake of Rome's statute, these contextual elements of crimes against humanity were also established in the statutes of the Court of East Timor and in the statute of the special rooms in Sierra Leone and the extraordinary chambers of the court of Cambodia, which all refer to acts committed in a widespread or systematic attack against civilian population. And in the latter, in the court of Cambodia, reintroduces that these must be in connection with the discrimination based on nationality, politics, ethnicity, race, or religion. So these are multi-offensive crimes, and they affect not only the individual victim, but the international community as a whole. So this legal asset is identified with the notion of humanity, which is understood as a value. So committing these crimes based on all this history that I have presented presupposes a threat to international peace. And so I think it's important to briefly speak of the interpretation that the International Criminal Court has been given to these contextual elements of the crimes against humanity. Um, of course, I cannot dwell on this too much because we have a very great number of rulings by the ICC related to the interpretation and the enforcement of this statute. So I'm going to mention just a few so that you can see what is the case law of the ICC in the interpretation of this. And also, as we said, what distinguishes international crime from regular crimes is the existence of certain contextual elements for the international crimes and without which there will not be the international nature of such crimes. And I have to repeat this because this is extremely important. In the case of crimes against humanity, the context is given by the norm. The conduct has to be committed as a part of a widespread or systematic attack against the civilian population. When we go to paragraph two of item A uh, of the Statute of Rome, it seems repetitive but it says that an attack directed against any civilian population means any course of conduct involving multiple commission of acts that are referred in paragraph one against any civilian population according to a state or organizational policy to commit such attack. So the country act has to be 
part of the participation of that attack. So there must be a functional relationship between the act and the context. And here I quote Alicia Hill Hill from Spain. She has some very excellent work regarding the interpretation of what are crimes against humanity. So there is no doubt or the senses when you say that the elements of the context are essential to the definition of crimes against humanity. So for this reason, it determines that the elements of the crime that the perpetrator or perpetrator commits, that they must act. And this is the last element for such crimes. They must act with malice. So the perpetrator knew that the conduct was part or intended to be part of a widespread or systematic attack against the civilian population. So that is part that is in the elements of the crime. It requires that there was knowledge, intention. These are elements that are required to hold accountable the alleged perpetrators of any of those conducts that are listed in the Article 7 of the Rome Statute. And according to certain authors, the element attacked against the civilian population is now considered an integral part of the concept of crimes against humanity, even by customary law, as the element of internalization of certain conduct. Were it not for this element, it would be an ordinary crime. So an attack need not necessarily be an armed attack. An attack is understood as a campaign, a course of actions against a civilian population. It does not have to be military or armed. And some say that there's not even necessarily need to have violent acts. And uh, in my humble opinion, I do not agree with that. I believe that an attack requires some kind of violence, which does not need to be physical violence. There must be some type of mistreatment, coercion, pressure, or oppression, a conduct that leads to justifiable fear of suffering, loss, injury, or harm. So when we read this together with paragraph two, an attack presupposes the multiple commission of the acts referred to in paragraph one. And the acts listed in paragraph one involve some kind of violence against civilian population. And as I say here, violence is a conduct, an operation, a number of actions against civilian population. And I take all of this is all based on the case of decision of Tango Tanga. And an attack can also be defined as a course of conduct involving the commission of violent acts that precede an armed attack. And it does not need to be part of the armed conflict. It can involve the mistreatment of civilian population, including by nonviolent attack. And here, William Sabas mentions the establishment of an architect system. So the generalized element as a rule, according to international case law, translates to a quantitative significance. So it must be repeated, widespread, large scale attacks against large number of victims or in large parts of a territory or on several occasions. 
considering the general rise element, this is the broad nature carried out collectively with seriousness directed against a multiplicity of victims. Thus, the element refers to both the broad scale of the at attack and the number of victims. However, and here I quote two decisions from the ICC. The first is situation in the Republic of Kenya. And this is pursuant to Article 15 that allowed to open an investigation in the violence, the pause electoral violence in the Republic of Kenya. And I also mentioned here part of the decision in the decision of confirmation of the charges of the prosecutor versus Jean-Pierre Bemba Combo, and that confirmed the charges. And here we have that the generalized attack may be the series of humane attacks or one single humane act of extraordinary magnitude. In determining the widespread nature of the attack, the chamber should consider the characteristic, objective nature and consequences of the conduct. And by systematic, according to the case law, it has been understood as the element of organization, of prior preparation, of systematic systematicity of the conduct or pattern of conduct. So these must not be random occasional or isolated acts committed by individuals from their own free will. They are rather the products of coordinated planned conducts that are part of a collective effort. And this element sometimes is confused with the statutory requirement that the acts must have been practiced in accordance with or implementation of a state organizational policy. Article 16 of the Code of Crimes Against Peace and Security of Humankind already provided that a crime against humanity is a conduct perpetrated in a systematic manner. And in the ICTY also interpreted the requirement as indicating a pattern, a methodology, an organization demonstrating this relationship between a series of isolated acts. When we see the final wording of Article 7, we see that the elements widespread and systematic do not need to be cumulative, but these elements need at least to overlap when we considered the quantitative and geographic criteria. So we must keep in mind the additional element of the existence of a policy to commit the attack. In the sense of proving the existence of a political objective, a political plan, an ideology in the broadest sense of this word. And here I quote Shabbos again. This is an ideology that seeks the destruction the weakening, the persecution of a specific community, addition to the preparation and use of public or private resources, the participation of high up in the political or military hierarchy. So on the existence of a policy for the commission of these conducts, there are those that understand that this requirement may be confused with the systematic and organized nature of the attack. However, in our view, although they may be similar in some respects, the systematic element of the conduct does not necessarily demonstrate in itself the existence of a deliberate policy of attack on the civilian population. And here uh, I quote the case again of Jermaine Katanga that says that it must be demonstrated that the state organization intended to commit that attack. 
the groups that govern specific territory and that they had the capacity to commit this widespread attack on the civilian population. An attack does not need to be formalized. The attack that is planned, directed, is opposed to spontaneous as isolated attack. The planning itself meets the criteria. And on this like topic, it is worth mentioning that doctrine to avoid expanding the notion of crime against humanity to any type of organized or, tran or transnational crime has been advocating for a stricter concept of crime against humanity. And once again, I quote Alicia Hill Hill, because I fully agree that the notion of crime against humanity needs to be the strict definition and that arrives from this slow but vigorous evolution of the concept, as I mentioned in the first part of my talk. This element is exactly the existence of a policy of a state organization. And it's worth remembering that the policy of this state organization, which promotes or encourages a widespread or systematic attack against the civilian population, may be an emissive policy, as stated in footnote six. It may be deliberate emission when it is guided, consciously directed to stimulate or implement the attack. So the mere absence of governmental organization action is not sufficient to affirm that such policy exists. And once again, I mention the ruling of the charges against Jean-Pierre Bemba Gomo in the ICC. So to have a crime against humanity, it's not enough to have criminal conduct in widespread geographic areas for a long time, causing a large number of victims. If it is demonstrated that these acts are isolated, spontaneous, and disconnected from each other. What is required is the proof of the existence of a state policy or an organization behind these acts. And the doctrine defines that this policy may be implicit. It does not need to be formalized or precisely defined. And it does not need to involve only the highest levels of the state organization. But they cannot be the product of a mere sum of isolated acts done by its members and on their own accord. It does not require active orchestration. It may be accomplished by the deliberate lack of action of those who have the duty to act or intervene. So the lack of action or omission, the criminal lack of action or omission can only be attributed to those that have the duty to act. So this policy can be inferred from the manner in which the acts occur, especially if shown that they would not have occurred spontaneously. And here I conclude the contextual elements of crimes against humanity as described in the Rome Statute are elements of criminal types. And it is on the evidence of these contextual elements that a crime against humanity within the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court. In other words, okay. Without the unequivocal demonstration of the existence of an attack against the civilian population, the systematic or widespread nature of such attack, and whether this attack is done 
with the fulfillment of a state of organization, we cannot talk about the existence of crimes against humanity. The element of context, however, translates the specialty of these contexts in relation to contexts which are considered of common law. And here I quote Antonio Cassis, the professor and formal judge of the ICC for the um, former Yugoslav, even though practiced by individuals, these conducts are connected to a state policy or an organization policy. That is to say, a criminal system, which is the trademark of international crimes. The international element or the context of organized violence. The exceptional gravity of uh, the crimes against humanity does have consequences. So active and uh, the active universal or even uh, international case law, these crimes are do not prescribe. They prohibit honesty. Thus, the character of internationality to crimes, even provoking disastrous consequences to one or more communities, should be admitted when all the elements of international crimes are demonstrated. Otherwise, it would uh, be against the strict legality of crimes and penalties. And this is a fundamental principle that has been mentioned in all international instruments to protect fundamental rights. It is worth remembering here that Article 22 of the Rome Statute expresses the principle of strict legality, which I have mentioned before. Nulla un crimen, nulla pena sine legge. And in conclusion, Article 21, Paragraph 3 of the Rome Statute provides that the interpretation and application of the statute and other sources of law listed therein must be in compliance with international recognized human rights. The professor is speaking on mute. Professor did have an internet connection problem. We are going to resume the conclusion as the professor's connection, internet connection has uh, been disconnected. I will conclude talk talking about the serious consequences of attributing the internationality to conducts that could or not be part of the list of crimes against humanity. These behaviors which behave or allow for the internationalization of these crimes, which open the doors to international case law or to global case law, are crimes that do not prescribe, that admit uh, sentences for life and other punishments, and therefore the character of internationality to these crimes, even though they lead to disastrous consequences to one or more communities, should only be admitted when all the elements of international crimes are demonstrated. And I remember that the strict legacy is mentioned in all international instruments that protect fundamental rights. From the French Declaration of 1898, we also remind that Article 21 in the Rome Statute, Paragraph 3, expresses that the application of the statute and other sources of law must be in compliance with internationally recognized human rights. So, my dear professors, 
Saliba and David and Lopez and all of you who were patient enough to listen to me. These are my closing words and I will now make myself available to provide any clarifications, answer any questions. And once again, I'd like to, I'd like to thank you very much for having inviting, invited me to come here and uh, give this opening statement for the summer school on Brazilian studies for the Federal University of Minas Gerais. Thank you very much for the interpretation team. I hope I was uh, nice to you. And Professor Saliba, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you very much. Well, first and foremost, I'd like to uh, congratulate you for this deep and very relevant and well-grounded speech. And this is very typical of not only a person who knows the theory and the practice of uh, criminal law and international law, but someone who helped build it. So your contribution here today is very important and you have given great contribution to this uh, line of law. So I thank you for on behalf of the Federal University of Minas Gerais, and thank you very much for the excellent lecture you opened the summer school program. I also co congratulate the coordinator of our summer school, Professor Lucas Lima. He has just joined us in the virtual room now. He was uh, listening to you, Professor, on YouTube first, but he's now with us here. So, Dr. Steiner, I have a number of questions that have been made on the chat box. We know your current uh, work, and uh, we know that uh, you might not uh, feel comfortable to answer some of these questions, so please feel, so, feel free to do so, if you understand there's any conflict of interest in the questions. But these are the questions we received from the chat. We have an array of questions that were made to you, and I'll try to group them up so we can make the most of the time we have. So I will start with a question by Ursula and Cecilia from, Alema from Germany and Puerto Rico. Question. The attack, can it be based on omission? So you're, if you're talking about uh, an attack under Article 7, can it be based on omission? And another question by Cecilia. Encouraging uh, conducts, would that also be considered a crime? Thank you very much for the questions. As for the first group of questions, I would, my answer is yes. Attack can be a conduct, an omission-based conduct, based on footnote 6 on the elements of crimes. But we are not talking about only omission here. There are some requirements. This omission needs to be deliberate. So it needs to be the, the, to have intention. And it needs to come from those who have the duty to act. So any omission in criminal law can only be attributed as a crime to those who have the duty to act. So once these requirements are present, then omission can be subject to punishment, provided it is deliberate and committed by those who had the duty to act. Evidence later will have to show the high probability or likelihood of that based on the case law. But we have to demonstrate the high probability and we have also to demonstrate that result would not have happened if there had no, not been omission. So the proof 
of this is one of the most difficult areas of uh, uh, criminal law but in international criminal law we have uh, established some attempts to set a standard which would be based on the high probability in which the result would not have happened if omission had not happened as well so the answer is yes omission can be uh, considered a crime. Now, you also talked about incitation. As a criminal attribution of uh, someone practicing a crime, uh, this exists for the crime of genocide. So if you encourage the practice of genocide and you are the author of the genocide, so encouragement of such crime can be qualified as a form of a crime that can be under punishment. So if you know international law, you know that the Rome Statute in its 25th article defines the types of uh, participation and authorship. So Participation is related to becoming an accomplice or to be, to giving some help to the crime per se. So encouraging the crime to happen can, in some circumstances, be configured as a way of participating in these crimes. But authorship, it can only be considered in crimes of genocide. We have a question of the director of the education school of education daisy moreira cunha she asks about the treatment given by international criminal law to slavery precari precarious or forced labor thank you very much professor daisy for your question well forced slave labor or any forms that are analogous to slave work, sexual slavery, are crimes that are under the uh, Rome Statute too, and they are considered crimes against humanity and some of them are even war crimes. It's important to highlight here that these behaviors are only considered crimes under the, I, the jurisdiction of the ICC once they are practiced in within a context of a generalized and systematic attack against the civilian population and as part of a state policy or an organizational policy. So the existence of a situation such as this one, if human beings are treated as slaves or are treated as slaves, if that is uh, present, you can only consider that a crime against humanity if it is considered a systematic attack on the civilian population, which I've mentioned in my lecture. Another question, Dr. Silvia is about ecocide. I'll try to group up. We have some states who have uh, typified ecocide as a crime. And this includes uh, substantial damage, the destruction of ecosystem and the health of uh, populations. In ecocide, you don't necessarily need a, a direct damage to live itself. So there's a proposal of including a third type of crime in the statute of uh, Rome, the Rome statute that would include ecocide. So we would like to hear your considerations of how viable and how convenient that is. And I'd also like to add a question by Rodrigo Franco here. Could we use crimes against humanity 
to encompass ecocide or at least partially encompass that thank you very much for those making these questions this group of questions this is also a recurring theme for a while now we have had some work groups made up of professionals especially in friends and uh, these groups intend to discuss the crime of ecocism echo side in the Rome statute this proposal has been refuted for a number of times even in 2010 when you had the Kampala conference in which we did have some room to amend the ROM statute. And once again, this proposal was rejected. So ecocide is not part of the ROM statute in turn. We do have war crimes included. So it's a crime committed during an armed conflict consisting of the use of war methods that would provoke damage that are lasting damage to the environment. But this is a war crime. Uh, the damage to the environment is a consequence, not even a war weapon, so to speak. So I believe that in 2015-16, we had the policy paper by the, the a section in the court to determine the factors that would be considered to assess the severity of certain crimes and uh, we by then we would also assess whether these crimes would have less uh, led to uh, everlasting damage to the environment when this discussion was happening we're, we're saying that the court was going to be fighting crimes against the environment. And we cannot do that if it's not included in the statute. Uh, but as you know, one of the criteria for the prosecution to open an investigation is the severity of the uh, offense. So what the prosecution, prosecutor's office wanted to say that among other aspects, lasting effects on environment would be taken into account. But once again, these damages as a consequence of having committed one of those crimes that are listed in the Rome statute. So crimes of war does not have environmental damages as an international crime. As of convenience or feasibility, well, I don't think there is any feasibility. And in my humble opinion, uh, neither convenience. We are not speaking of crimes of humanity in war crimes. When we are speaking of this, I attain myself to the historical evolution of these that are also known as crimes against peace. The International Criminal Court, as determined in Rome statute, has condensed this long historical evolution, both of norms and customs of crimes against humankind, safety, and peace. So I do not see the feasibility of crimes against environment or drug trafficking and other conducts related to the so-called organized crimes within the jurisdiction of the ICC, which, as I mentioned, create very serious effects. They're not subject to statutory limitations. Um, there is life imprisonment as a penalty. So 
those specific conducts of the Rome Statute are not there for random reasons and do they are due to this historical evolution that I spoke of today. And this question of if we cannot list um, as crimes against humanity and to use a more common language, if we can't fit crimes against environment um, as a crime against humanity. And in the last item of Article 7, it says other inhumane acts of a similar character intentionally causing great suffering or serious injury to body or to mental or physical health. So this is an open clause to define crimes. So other inhumane acts of a similar character. So similar to those already listed about the murder, enslavement, rape, torture. So it's an open clause, uh, but it's not broadly open. It is restricted to crimes similar to the other ones listed. And I think that crimes against environments that are committed by states or organizations and even lawful organizations. And we've had here uh, in Brazil examples of irreparable harm to the environment, but I do not see how to fit that. That doesn't exist in criminal law under the principle of legality. We can't fit into that item K, the open clause. I don't see the feasibility or convenience. I think that the nations need to be prepare, prepared for that, even regionally, because they are often transnational crimes, especially with regard to compensation of damages and reparation of damages. And in my personal opinion, I think that is a lot more important for the community than anything else. So in these cases, uh, I believe that defining that as a criminal conduct would not be the most appropriate course. Uh, we say here that the most sensitive part of the human body is their pocketbooks. So for certain conducts, it is much better when you demand reparation of the harms caused and reparation to the victims than persecution and a criminal case which may not result in anything. And that's my personal opinion. Yes, a lot of people think of criminal courts as a solution to all evil, but it is it often has to be the last step in these cases. Uh, we have some other questions and to make sure we attain to the time reserved for this, I'm going to group two of these questions. And the first is from Professor Juan of UFMG, who says of uh, the possibility of the conduct of a state leader be classified as a crime against humanity of their conduct during the pandemic. And then we have Kenneth from Panama who asks, how is the penalty enforced? So the person that is convicted by the ICC, where do they fulfill their penalty? Okay, well, I'm going to start with the other one, the enforcement of 
the penalty because that is expressed in the Rome Statute, and they can serve their sentence in any nation that has an agreement with the ICC. So the nation will offer to receive the convicted person, and they are always heard. So, of course, preference is given to their place of origin so that they can be close to their family, but them don't want to do that and prefer to go to another nation. And there are quite a great number of states uh, that have filed the letter of acceptance of those convicted by the court and they will be subject to the regime of that state. But the enforcement is by ICC. So any changes to the conditions and so on is all under the jurisdiction of the ICC. So the administrative jurisdiction is of the nation where they're going to serve their sentence. And as for João's question, that has been a recurrent question. So when we speak of a head of state uh, and their conduct in the pandemic, there are two ways for us to look at that situation. If we're speaking of mere omission, a state uh, that doesn't have a proper policy for treating COVID-19, that did not take the necessary measures, uh, that pretended that it was nothing serious. And uh, then, and I have to repeat, footnote six related to the elements of crime. Mere omission does not lead to criminal responsibility. There's going to be criminal responsibility if there is malice or willful omission. So it has to be deliberate. And that's expression in footnote six. And second, this deliberate omission must have had the intention of being an attack against the civilian population. And this omission must have been by someone that had the duty to act and failed to do so. So these are the requirements for any omission to be punishable as an international crime. So that's the framework. And so it relates to evidence. So if we have a country that their administration didn't do anything, it's a disorganized government and they simply didn't act and the pandemic was widespread. No matter how high the number of victims or the misconduct, we can't speak of crime against humanity. However, if the people that had the duty to act for any willful or intentional way said, I'm not going to do anything, and well, people die, I that's not a problem. I have other interests. I'm not going to spend time on this. Then in this case, you may have a crime against humanity configured. 
Thank you very much once again, Professor Sylvia Steiner, for this excellent lecture and your brilliant answers to the questions. It's always a great pleasure to be with you, and I hope that soon we will be able to do this in person here in Belo Horizonte. Thank you, Professor Aziz Saliba, Professor Davison. I truly thank you for this invitation. It's a great honor to be part of this summer school and to give this opening lecture. So I'm deeply honored and I hope I lived up to the expectations of those here. And I also truly hope that soon we will be able to meet in person. This is a theme that's very dear to me. It's a very current topic. We can see the question by the questions and comments made. And so I hope I somehow contributed to clarify the legal standpoint of what are crimes against humanity and how they are configured. So thank you very much. Yes, we thank you. And also for those of you that are in Brazilian timeline, have a great day or a good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Once again, thank you.